Welcome back. Uh, I just wanted briefly to give you some of the messages which I gave yesterday. And uh, then we are going to continue with the derivation of these expectation values. And uh, one of these uh, uh, set of uh, results which we get is something you will play around with in one of the exercises. But quickly, just to give you one of the uh, uh, messages and links to where you find information. So the uh, weekly plan has, uh, as you will see here, there's a video of the lecture right after the lecture, typically some few hours after the lecture is being uploaded. And it takes some time to generate the uh, the subtitles, but you will have the video and then you have also the whiteboard notes from the lecture. So you can always look them up again in case uh, you lost them or whatever. So the kind of uh, material which we cover through the whiteboard will always be uploaded as a PDF file. And you will find this information on the uh, weekly schedule or this uh, team plan that's called here. This is actually one of the things we wanted to be changed. We've been asking this for 15 years. So sometimes when you have the English version, there are some remnants of Norwegian words <laughs> which uh, don't get changed. So you will see English words, but suddenly instead of a weekly schedule, you will see team plan here. <laughs> okay. Hey. And um, then... Uh, you will find the same information if you go to the weekly slides and you click on the links here on Money Body Physics and you look at the weekly slide. Uh, what I typically do after the lecture is that I upload the link uh, to the video and then you will also see a link to the whiteboard notes. So I will do that after every lecture. So uh, in our case, we are going to have a, a new upload today and you will also find the whiteboard notes. So all the information will typically be put in these two places. And I also have the announcement to the same links on Canvas. So hopefully then you can see where you can fetch the relevant information. So what I want to do now is to go back to where we were yesterday. And this is partly, that material is partly covered by the slides from last week. And what we were doing was to calculate the expectation values of a money body wave function. And we could simplify that if we made the assumptions about this way of rewriting the, the wave function ansatz. And with that uh, ansatz, we could then simplify the calculations. So let's quickly remind ourselves about that and then look at the results which we will get when we uh, uh, compute these expectation values. Furthermore, in the exercises today, the first exercise, you are partly going to repeat many of these calculations here. But then we are going to look at a more general two-body and one-body operator. So the exercise which will come after 12 o'clock, then we will have the exercise session. The aim there is to go through uh, the material which we have covered uh, yesterday and the week before and partly today. So let's uh, uh, bring back the, uh, the whiteboard and uh, try to refresh what we did yesterday. So what we had was a uh, expectation value of uh, the Hamiltonian with a given wave function ansatz. So this is just a quick repeat of where we were yesterday. So we made an ansatz for the ground state in terms of uh, a wave function, which is a product of single particle states, but it is also anti-symmetrized. And the simplest way to make this ansatz is to use a determinant because that includes automatically the anti-symmetry. And we could see that when you change one of the columns, the wave function changes sign. So the ansatz, and I put a zero to indicate that this is a ground state, the lowest line state. And we label this in terms of all the possible positions which the particles can take up to Xn. And then we had a set of quantum numbers which in our case went up to n as well, or n minus one, since I start my labeling at zero. And these specific quantum numbers are then slots, which are filled up to the Fermi level. So we are assuming now that we have a level and we fill all the single particle states up to that level. That defines the Fermi level. <clears throat> and this ansatz, if there is a strong overlap with the exact solution, we could say then that the ansatz is a pretty good one. If there is a small overlap, 
that clearly means that we need to labor a little bit more to find the solution through our favorite money body problem. So this is now given in terms of this determinant, which is called a Slater determinant. And then we have the single particle wave functions, alpha zero. And then we have the, in the columns, we have the particles, the positions of the particles. And in the rows, we have the different single particle states the system can be in. And this is also a way to account for the fact that these are indistinguishable and uh, identical particles. So we don't know whether particle one is in slot alpha zero, alpha one, or which one of these slots it is in. And then we have a alpha zero. So I'm just rewriting this one. And this continues all the way up to alpha zero. So the rows represent the slots where the particles can be in, and the columns represent the position of the particles. And this is an alpha n minus one, and then I have xn here. And then we rewrote this in terms of this anti-symmetrization operator. We first rewrote it like this, of n factorial, and then we had a sum over all the possible permutations, and then we have a minus p, and then we have the permutation operator, which interchanges, for instance, two columns in this determinant. And then we have this uh, Slater, this Hartree product, which was simply the product of all the single particle wave functions along the diagonal. So this is a way by which we order the single particle states. You can choose whatever ordering you do, but it's pretty common to use this ordering and define that one using the uh, energy levels of the system. So I just wanted to repeat these things. And then we have an X of N like that. And what we also defined uh, was this operator, which we could rewrite in terms of uh, this projection operator. So we could rewrite it. We defined this one as a Hartree product. And I'm skipping the X1 and alpha one dependencies. And we defined this operator a one over n, and this was given by the sum over p, and then I had a minus a one, uh, sorry, <clears throat> let me just rewrite it on the other page, so it doesn't get that messy here. And then just let me remind you myself about what I wrote like yesterday. I don't say something wrong here. Yeah, the uh, operator A is something we defined as one over N, and then we had the sum over P, all the permutations, minus one to the power of permutation and P here. So if we have uh, two particles, we would simply have zero permutations and one possible permutations of the two particles. So with n equal to two, this operator became equal to one over two factorial, which is two. And then we would have one minus P1, P2. And this is an operator which interchanges two columns in this determinant. And then what we found was that when we calculated the expectation value here of phi zero, these ansatz of H zero and phi zero, then we found that this one was given as the sum over the single particle states because we assumed that the basis which we had, or which we have, is a basis which depends, which is an eigenbasis of one part of the Hamiltonian. And in our case, this is the single particle operator, which normally includes kinetic energy, a potential energy, an external potential, and uh, the uh, eventually other one body operators. So they just acts on a particle at a time. And in that case, we would have a sum over alpha i, which goes from zero up to the last state in this specific case, because these are the states which are filled, and we had an epsilon alpha i. This is the case, uh, now in case we have a, a, a single particle basis and an operator, 
where this single particle basis is an eigen state of that operator. If it's not the case, then we uh, uh, would then have to calculate expectation values of that operator. So these epsilon alpha i's are actually expectation values. But what you would then uh, normally put in here would be just an integral. So if you have an, if h zero is replaced by an operator, a general operator of a one body type, when I put O here, then this epsilon alpha i, that would change over to an integral over alpha i, and then I would have this specific operator. And then I would have the phi alpha y. And these are operators which also can connect uh, different single particle states. And what we found yesterday was that if we now have an expectation value to a general Slater determinant from this h0 <coughs> to this phi 0, so if uh, phi of i differs by one single particle state, then this expectation value could be different from zero if such an integral, which you see here, is different from zero. However, if uh, we look at the uh, Hamiltonian for the unperturbed part, I mean the one body part, which is also called the unperturbed part, unperturbed because we don't have a perturbation of the two body type, then uh, this expectation value would be equal to zero if we have a different single particle state. Because what you would have then would be a state here where we would have a, a J, which would come in. Because you would have a single particle state on the bra side, which will be different from the cat side. And unless this operator is non-zero, then this contribution would be zero. So this goes back to one of the exercises you will see a little bit later, but you will also practice today with a similar expectation values. Now, what we did next was to move on to the two-body interaction. And for the two-body interaction, the important thing then is that we got the following results. So we have this phi zero of hi and phi zero. And we could write this one in terms of a sum over i less than j. So this is the interaction matrix element. And we would then have uh, integrals of the following type. So let's just put up the integral. So we would have a dx1, dx2, up to dxj. No, sorry, dx. There would be a dxi here, a dxj. And then the final dxn. And then we had the Hartree state, which would then be given by phi of alpha zero, complex conjugate x one, all the way up to phi alpha n minus one, complex conjugate of x of n. Sorry. And this is now multiplied with the interaction Vxi, Vxj. And then what we had was the uh, sum over all the possible permutations. So we would have a sum of a P minus one to the power of P. And then we had the same product, the so-called Hartree product of X1 all the way up to phi alpha N minus one of x n. And what we looked at last time was a case when we had p equal to zero, zero permutation. And what happens then, if we have zero permutations, this integral, which now follows this sum here, will now pick the components xi and xj for a specific value here. And we would then pick the wave functions which are relevant. All the other integrals, when k is different from i and j, 
then we will get integrals of the type dx, let's say k, and then we will have a phi alpha k complex conjugate and multiplied with phi alpha k. So there will be for a given k, which means one of these single particle states here, which is different from i and j, which is not involved with the interaction, then this quantity here it will appear. And if the state is normalized and orthogonal, then this is just going to be equal to one. So we will have for all the states except i and j, we will just get a product of ones. And then the uh, p equal uh, zero case is then going to give us a term which we label as alpha i, alpha j, the interaction, and alpha i and alpha j. And then we have to make this sum. That was for the zero perturbation part. Then if I make a perturbation of uh, two particles, so in, and if we interchange i and j, if we do that, you see then that if we interchange i and j, we will still have a product of ones because the interaction will act on i and j. And now we can interchange i and j because we will have an integral over i and j. So that is going to give us something which is non-zero. So if we then just remind ourselves of where we were yesterday, so when I have p equal to one, one perturbation, no, one permutation, sorry, then we would get a sum over i less than j. And then I would have alpha i, alpha j, and v. And then I have what we call the exchange part. So we have interchanged i and j. Now, when I'm setting this up now, if I go beyond uh, p equal one, I'm going to make a new permutation. So I could now permute particle one and two, their positions, but I could also permute three and four. If I now permute three and four, so if P is equal to two or larger than two, so suppose now I say that I is equal to one and J is equal to two here. So I perform one permutations on one and two, so that means I will have an integral over dx1, dx2 here. And then I have phi alpha. And then this is alpha 0, because I have x1 here. Complex conjugate, phi alpha 1 of x2. Complex conjugate. My interaction is now vx1 and x2. And this is now multiplied with the product of alpha zero and alpha one, which now has been interchanged. So this will be multiplied and it has a minus sign. So it's gonna be multiplied with phi alpha zero, but now I have X two here. And then I have phi alpha one of X one. But now I'm also performing a new permutation because I have said that they have two permutations. So what could happen is that now I have a new integral which says dx3 and dx4. So the permutation here would be p12 and p34. That means that I will get something which now reads phi alpha 2 for x3 and phi alpha 3 for x4. That's the complex conjugated part. And then I have a phi alpha two of X four, because now I interchange three and four, multiplied with alpha three of X three. And this is zero. So beyond a one permutation, I will get zero. And you will see this when you now in the exercises are going to set up by three by three Slater determinant because then you will see that you have to make permutations, which will contain a permutation of one and two, two and three, but you will also make further permutations. And they are going to give rise to a result, which will 
look like this, where you're taking the expectation value of a uh, uh, matrix element or a, an interaction element with the integral, but then you will have changed the quantum number so that you cannot get the orthonormality for the states which are not involved with the interaction. So that means that this is going to be zero for P larger than equal than two. So one thing which I would recommend typically is just to set up a free by free determinant and try to calculate the matrix uh, expectation values. These expectation values with just a free by free slater determinant. And then you will see that when you go beyond just the standard permutation of two particles, then you will get zero. So that's a useful exercise. Okay, so that means that when we do this, we get the final result for phi zero of H zero of H I phi zero, which is equal to a sum over I less than J. And then I have these two matrix elements or two, these two integrals, which is a more correct way of stating it, but we will often in a very sloppy language, we're going to call these matrix elements because we are going to rewrite this as a matrix. The reason for why this is going to be rewritten later as a matrix is that you can combine the subscripts I and J into one. So that represents a two-body configuration. And then you will have on the cat side another two-body configuration with another subscript. So the index for the bra side could lead to one subscript and for the cat side to another subscript. And then you can define a matrix where you store these matrix elements. That's why we often call these for matrix elements, although the more correct name is actually <clears throat> integrals because this is what they actually are. These are shorthands for integrals. And we will use this notation for the rest of the course actually. So this will be an AJ, AI. This is often rewritten uh, in terms of a sum where we sum freely. The reason for that is that sometimes when you run calculations, a calculation, if you have an if test or a limit on your sums, that can slow down the calculation. So what happens often is that people would just rewrite this as just as a free sum, because then we sum over i and j freely, but then we need a factor of a half because we are double counting. And also keep in mind that if i is equal to j, this sum is zero. And that is simply a way of uh, seeing the Pauli principle that uh, not more than one particle can occupy a single particle state. So if you put i equal to j, this contribution is exactly equal to zero. And then you would simply rewrite this in terms of these two matrix elements, which we have here. Or alternatively, you can now use this anti symmetrized matrix element, which we put up. And then you would simply rewrite it in terms of alpha i, alpha j, or v, alpha i, alpha j, anti symmetrized. So these are just alternative ways of writing the same expression. Now, what you uh, we see now is that this expectation value, if we call this the expectation value of the ground state energy with our ansatz. So this is not the exact result because we made an ansatz. We don't know whether phi zero, so in principle, phi zero, if I take the full Hamiltonian and calculate with phi zero, this is not equal to the exact ground state times phi zero. But since we have an ansatz, nobody hinders us from calculating, right? Because these integrals are integrals which we normally can evaluate. So that means that we get a result and this result may not be the optimal one. So we get a sum now over the single particle states from zero up to n minus one. And then we have this epsilon alpha i's. And then finally we have the next term, which is a free sum and then I'm simply going to rewrite everything in terms of this anti symmetrized matrix element. And this is anti symmetrized. 
So this is a very compact way of expressing this expectation value. Now, in one of the exercises next week, uh, we are also going to look at the transition probability when we go from a state phi mm -hmm. zero to a state which differs by one single particle state. And you will find that that matrix element is different from zero. When we go from a state uh, which uh, to a next state which differ by two single particle states, we are still going to get a matrix element which is non-zero. But when we then uh, go from one state to a new state, which has three different single particle energies with a two body interaction, that is going to be exactly equal to zero. So let me just summarize this because you will show this in an exercise. So in this case, we have a expectation value. We go from the same state to the same state. If we now uh, have a new expectation value or transition probability, so we go from a state phi zero to a state, and now we are looking at the interaction part. We found that for the non-interacting part, this is exactly equal to zero, but it could be non-zero in case we have an operator which does not have the basis as eigenbasis. So we have to be careful, and you will play around a little bit with that in the exercise. If we now go to a state phi of i, and this phi of i differs by a single particle state by one single particle state only. If we do that, you're going to show that this one, this sum, is going to be proportional to a, a single sum. So I'm just setting proportional because you're actually going to show this in the exercises. So this is going to be a single sum and there will be a set of states. So I'm just gonna call this for a state K here. So what we can say now in this specific Slater determinant by a single particle state. So what we have then is that in here, we would have a state phi alpha of L which then will be different in the other one with a quantum number phi alpha of k. So this Slater determinant has a state alpha k for particle x, let's call this particle xj and particle xj here. They differ by just this single particle quantum numbers. In that case, there will be a sum which then goes like alpha L, alpha K of V, alpha L, alpha K, anti-symmetrized. So this will be the exercise next week. And then finally, if we have now a phi, zero, or just any Slater determinant, a general Slater determinant, where this phi of I, where this differs by two single particle states, by two single particle states. And we call these single particle states for, so they're gonna be a state phi alpha of K for X I, and then phi and phi alpha L, or xj. So these are two particles, and they have quantum numbers now alpha k and alpha l. So this will be on the ket side. And then we have on the bra side, we have phi mm -hmm. alpha i of xi and phi alpha j for xj. So in this specific case, what you will get is that this expectation value, so phi, it doesn't need to be phi zero. It could be any Slater determinant. But we have just made a uh, assumption here that uh, we differ by, the, this, these states differ by just uh, one single part, two single particle states. If I do that, 
then we can show that this is exactly equal to an alpha of i, alpha j, and then we have an alpha k and alpha l anti-symmetrized. So I'm not going through the derivation because this is going to be an exercise next week. So I'm just anticipating. And what you have here are normally called the Condon Slater rules. So if we have more, if we have more than, than two single particle states which differ, SP stands for single particle, states which differ, and we have a two-body interaction at most, then this is equal to the roundest number you can think of, zero. So we need to add these other statements. And if we have at most a two-body interaction, interaction, then this matrix element, which we're looking at, or this transition probability or transition element of phi of i is exactly mm -hmm. equal to zero. Because then the orthonormality will kick in. And you can see that if you want to convince yourself, you can just set up a uh, Slater determinant with three particles only. And then you can easily see that there will be matrix elements we will have to deal with the orthogonality of uh, two single particle states, which are different. So this is something which you will practice a little bit next week, but I just wanted to state them. And this means that when you have these rules and you have a specific Hamiltonian, that means you, you can actually look at the matrix elements and the slate determinants you have and simply state which one will be zero and which will be non-zero. This means also that when you have defined these single particle states, so this is a, from a computational point of view, this is a very important aspect because what you would typically do computationally is that every Slater determinant is stored as a single word. So if the state is occupied, this is a bit string. If the state is occupied, bit one. If the state is not occupied, zero. So if you have uh, 10 slots, you would need 10 bits. And if you have four particles, you can place them in the different slots. And from a computational point of view, what you would do then is that you would simply compare these two words, these two bit strings. And if these differ by more than two bits, then the expectation value is equal to zero. So that's the typical test you will do when you're setting up the full Hamiltonian matrix, which we are coming back to when we discuss a money body method, which is called full configuration interaction theorem. So one exercise which we are going to see a little bit later is the encoding of Slater determinants. But let me just mention this briefly. So from a computational point of view, it is practical to encode these Slater determinants as bit strings. So suppose now that you have 10 single particle states. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is your alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, and this goes up, up all the way up to alpha n here. Now, when you then uh, look at this system and you have four particles, you could now think of placing these four particles here. That would be one Slater determinant. In that case, you would represent this as a bit string. So you can now think of the first slot, which is alpha zero. That is bit one. And then you have alpha one, alpha two, all the way up to alpha n, 
this is your state. So you have bit one, bit one here, and let's put alpha three, that has bit one, and all the remaining ones would be zeros. So bit one, if it's occupied, bit zero, if it's not occupied. So that could be one slater determinant. Now you could define another slater determinant. So you don't need to write it like that. You could simply just write it like one, 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 zero, 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 like this. So that would be your bit string. So 10 single particle states, you need 10 bits to represent them. And each one of these slots points to the specific quantum numbers, which you can look up in a table. The computational uh, procedure which you would use normally is then if you take another state, so suppose we take, we have the same 10 single particle states, uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So we have alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two. So let me put the labels on all of them. Right. Now we could think of having uh, the particles in uh, these slots here. That means that we would have a representation where we would have a state which is zero, 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 zero. And then we have one, 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 and zero, zero. So that is our new state. And let's call this phi of one. When you then want to calculate the expectation value or this matrix element, as we call them, of hi or h1, h0 as well, what we would do then is simply to say, okay, we have a two body interaction. What I do now is to compare the two words or the two bit strings, phi zero and phi one. And then you will see that the bits don't overlap. That means that there is no common single particle state in these two cases. And since you have a two body interaction, this means that the matrix element here has to be equal to zero. So you don't need to calculate anything. You can just compare the uh, bit strings. And if they have a difference with more than two single particle states, which means two bits differ, or if only two bits differ, then these matrix elements will be non-zero. If there are more than two bits which differ, then it's automatically zero. So this kind of bit string comparisons are pretty fast to implement numerically. So you see, you can avoid many calculations. Now, there's another reason why I took this up, I brought this up. And that's because this lends itself to second quantization. So second quantization is now going to be a way to formulate the same information, but where we leave the information about the spatial degrees of freedom and all the other quantum numbers. What we are just going to look at now is whether a state, a single particle slot, is occupied or not. And if it's occupied, it's bit one. If it's not occupied, it's bit zero. So what I'm doing here from a computational perspective is something which uh, motivates why second quantization is so useful because second quantization on fermions means that we can use Boolean algebra and we can represent uh, states in a very efficient way when we run computations. So this is a kind of, a, it sounds a little bit strange, where's the physics here? But this actually motivates uh, why we end up using second quantization as a very compact formalism for dealing with fermionic and bosonic systems. So this is also something which we typically have had as an exercise a little bit later in the semester. So when we're going to represent uh, Slater determinants in a more compact way. Any questions so far? Okay, so the thing I wanted to do now is also to point to some material from last week uh, about uh, things which are going to come, but which are technicalities which are useful to have seen once, and then we're going to use them again. So I wanted to switch back to the slides.
And then we, <clears throat> after we've done that, we are going to take a small break. So if you go back to the uh, material from last week, and then we just scroll down on the slides here. So if you scroll down till the very end, you will now see the expectation value, which we put up. But there is also something which uh, is going to be of interest for us. As I said, we don't have the exact wave function. But when we have an orthogonal basis, we can always expand the exact solution in terms of that orthogonal basis. And that is normally given by this expansion here. So where this uh, phi of lambda can be an orthogonal basis. And the psi of p here is a new basis, which is a linear expansion in terms of that orthogonal basis. So this basis is normally assumed to be the solution of parts of the problem as we have been discussing till now. And we assume that there is such a solution, which is also physically relevant. So if you're dealing with electrons, which are trapped in small areas, which look like harmonic oscillators, quantum dots, that's the physical realization in solid state physics, in semiconductor physics and nanotechnologies. These are very hot systems, especially for making quantum computers. Then we, uh, uh, could use the harmonic oscillator as a basis. And the harmonic oscillator is something which we know how to solve if H0 is given by the harmonic oscillator. Now, the thing which is interesting for us, besides this uh, showing that the new basis is also orthogonal, is that we can uh, express, and here you will find some information about Slater determinants. And if you have an orthogonal single particle basis, and you construct a new basis of Slater determinants, what you will find down here is that you can actually express the new Slater determinants in terms of the previous one, but where you have the determinant of the coefficients, of these coefficients C here. That means that uh, you can also show then that the Slater determinants, this linear combination of Slater determinants, that each Slater determinant will also be an orthogonal determinant to the other auto, uh, Slater determinants. So when a single particle basis is orthogonal and you make this money body basis of Slater determinants, you will get a money body basis, which is also orthogonal. So some of the mathematics here, which we will not cover in the lectures, uh, show you exactly this, but we are coming mm -hmm. back to it. But I just wanted to mention it. The thing now, which is interesting, is that this energy which we calculated here, this is the expectation value of this ground state, which we just calculated. You can rewrite that in the new basis. So every such Slater, so this is a Slater determinant, the ansatz. This is a new ansatz in terms of the old basis. And you can show that these are given now by the coefficients, which are the overlap coefficients between the single particle basis states. So when we come to a, a full configuration interaction theory and also Hartree-Fock theory, which uh, is one of these kitchen items in money body physics, then we're actually going to start with these expressions here. And then we will use the variational theorem to optimize these parameters. And then we will get a new set of equations, which are also pretty similar to the equations for density functional theory. So, we can construct a single particle basis, a new one, defined in terms of an orthogonal basis. We can use this orthogonal basis to define an orthogonal basis of Slater determinants. Then we can expand the exact wave function, money body wave function, in terms of a basis of orthogonal Slater determinants. So the, uh, if the single particle basis is orthogonal, we construct an ansatz in terms of this product of single particle states. Then this ansatz and all the possible combinations we have will also be something which forms an orthogonal basis. So these are things which we will also work on a little bit later, but I just mentioned them now because this is something I will bring up again. So this terminates uh, some of the practicalities and uh, equations which we can derive with standard first quantization. Now, if you go back to the, what we had on the whiteboard with this compact representation, 
this is something which can be implemented with second quantization. And when you run a code with such a representation, since we have used second quantization, you can use standard Boolean algebra on the operations of a given Hamiltonian on a specific state. And that's extremely powerful when you're going to write your own money body code. Take a small break, just 15 minutes, stretch legs, guys. Uh -huh. So what we want to do now, based on uh, this kind of uh, way of uh, encoding the information about the state in terms of uh, a string of bits, what we want to do now is to formalize this through second quantization. So you can think of second quantization as you transforming away some specific degrees of freedom. The consequence for us is then that we assume in many practical implementations that you have pre-calculated all the integrals. So you operate only with indices, and then you find out which indices are the relevant ones. And when you have the relevant indices, you look up in the table and you find the contributions to the energy, for instance, or the contributions to given expectation value. So often, what happens is then that these matrix elements have to be pre-calculated. And then you just have a table of them. There, there is a limit to how much you can store. And for some specific cases, you will actually see people who have dedicated uh, most of their reserves time on finding efficient algorithms where you can calculate matrix elements on the fly, given the indices i and j and k and l which you transfer to the table which has the matrix elements or a function which calculates the matrix elements. But in general, when you look at these type of problems, if you look at the, uh, the calculation of this, this uh, matrix elements which we listed, a matrix elements like the one which you see here, normally you would pre-calculate them because this can be quite time consuming. Uh, some cases you may have analytical results which are easy to set up or easy to calculate numerically because at the end you make a numerical table. But the uh, uh, thing now is that we are going to operate with uh, the indices. So we're going to look at the state, like uh, the state which you have here, this example which we looked at. So you could rewrite that as a determinant where alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three are occupied. So if we take this specific example, let's take a closer look at that. So what we would like to do now, suppose we have a case with n equal to four, and then we have this uh, 10 single particle states. So, and then we have alpha zero, alpha one, and all the way up to alpha nine. So we have uh, uh, nine, uh, single particle states. And we could now think of putting these four particles in the first four single particle states. So we could then make an ansatz for a state, which I'm now going to use in this uh, Dirac bracket notation. So we could write it like an alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three. This is going to be the compact way which we would like to represent a Slater determinant. So remember again that this would now be the tensor products of all the states. And then together with the machinery about Slater determinants, this is going to now represent in a compact way a Slater determinant. So this is a compact representation. of a Slater determinant, SD for Slater determinant. Now, what we could think of now is to define operators which create and destroy single particle states. So we're going now to make a definition here. So we define, define a creation operator
as follows. So we have an empty state, which we call the vacuum. There is nothing in there. So we have an operator which acts on a specific vacuum state, zero. So this is vacuum our vacuum. And this now creates a particle in that specific state. So this will be a single particle state. And we are going to label it like this. So that is a uh, state which now we can change if we have two particles. I could now think of a Slater determinant, which is given by alpha and beta. And I would write that as A alpha, and we have this dagger, for, which means that we have a creation operator, which create a particle in that specific state. And then we have an alpha beta acting on this vacuum state. So if you go back to the first case which we had, you could think of that, this alpha, this phi zero, which we put up here. This is something which we could think of alpha zero, alpha one, A alpha two here, A alpha three, acting on zero. So that's the state which we put up in the beginning here. This is a compact representation we will now simply say that the slot alpha zero is occupied by one particle. So what we do now is that we define these operators which simply create a particle in that specific slot. And it carries the quantum number or the slot which we want to allocate this particle in. So that's the uh, uh, way we could represent a Slater determinant. One thing which we also need to do now is to assume that this representation of a Slater determinant re respects anti-symmetry. So that means that what I want now is that this specific example which I put up, this alpha zero, alpha one, so I want to construct a constraint on these operators so that if I interchange alpha one and alpha two, for instance, that should obey the same anti-symmetry requirements which I had in first quantization. When we dealt first quantization is a kind of wrong name because it gives a feeling that there are different ways of quantization. It's simply a representation of a state where you spell out all the degrees of freedom. Whereas now we are going to use a compact formalism where the emphasis will be on the number of particles which occupy specific states. So a better name for second quantization is the number representation. And that's a name which people often use, but then through, how to say, tradition and practice, people just call this second quantization. But a more correct name would be the number representation, because now we are just going to look at the number of particles which occupy a given state. And if we limit ourselves to fermions, it's either one or zero. So this is a binary system. If we go to bosons, we can have tons of particles which occupy the same single particle state. So that will be different and that will give us a different way of representing the states. But if I now change alpha one and alpha two, what I want now is that this should obey this property here. Now, there is something which I also want to bring back. You remember that yesterday we talked about a normal ordering or the kind of ordering which we've chosen for the hierarchy of single particle states. So we have alpha zero as the lowest one, alpha one as the next. So we typically fill the states in that kind of hierarchy. But then we know that due to the anti-symmetry, they can interchange positions. But we are going to use this as what we will call the standard ordering or the normal ordering of the state. And that means that every interchange here is going to bring a sign change due to the anti-symmetry. So if I do this and I want to represent, so suppose now you performed an operation with your operator on a state. And this is what you have after that operation. 
So that interchanges. It could be a permutation on a system. What you want to do at the end is that you want to represent this state here in terms of your basic ordering. And that means that there is a minus sign. Now, the reason for that is that you don't want to store all the permutations. Your operator, when it acts on a state, produces many types of operations and permutations, for instance. But then you want to relate everything to the way you have labeled the state and, and stored it. So you can obviously store all the permutations, but that would quickly exceed your storing capacity in a given computer, right? So that's mean, that's the reason why we would normally have this as a standard ordering. And then we want to relate expectation values to the way we order the single particle states. So this is a standard ordering which we use like we did for the Slater determinant where we had along the diagonal, we had the product of these single particle wave functions, which we call the Hartree product. That is just a way which we use to order the states. So uh, if we now have, uh, suppose we have this state here. So this specific state, which we have set up. So this alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, you will often see that people put a subscript anti-symmetrized, but now we are just going to deal with fermions. So it has to be anti-symmetric. This is given by A alpha zero, A alpha one, A alpha two, A alpha three, acting on the vacuum state. This is our definition. If I now uh, multiply this, with an A alpha, this specific state, alpha zero, so sorry. This is now going to be given by A alpha dagger, A alpha zero, A alpha one, A alpha two, and A alpha three multiplied with the vacuum state. Now, there are some constraints which we have to be careful with here. What happens if alpha is one of the alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three? Suppose alpha could now be equal to one of these, just one of them, alpha zero, sorry, not, not A, What should this operation give us then? Any good idea? If it has the same quantum numbers as one of the others? Yeah. Um, well, fair enough. Should be okay. Have the same particles. Or but if you, if, so, so think now of uh, these uh, states. So we have filled, let's say, a particle in here. So these are already occupied. And now I'm trying to put a new particle in alpha zero. Yeah, just an island, not just one. So this should be zero, right? Because it's not possible. So if alpha is equal to one of these, then this should give us automatically zero. So this is a new definition, but if the state is occupied, then it has to be zero because we cannot have more than one particle in a single particle slot. So that means that if we have A alpha zero dagger, A alpha zero acting on the vacuum state, this has to be equal to zero. So they have to be different. That's an important aspect. Now, the way we would do this now, when you, when you if this is different from uh, these states, so let's assume that. So let's now assume that alpha is different from those which are occupied. Then what we get is a new state, which is alpha, alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, 
and alpha-3. However, we have chosen an ordering where we say that uh, these states are ordered so that alpha-0 is the first one, alpha-1 is the next, alpha-2, alpha-3, etc., up to some alpha of d minus 1. That's the total number of states which we have. So we've chosen this ordering. So when you look at this state here, we would like to bring it into that type of ordering which we have decided upon. So suppose now that alpha is equal to five or alpha five, that specific state. So we would like to order this in the following way. We would have alpha zero, alpha one, mm -hmm. alpha two, alpha three, and alpha five. So this has to do with the ordering which we have chosen. So you can uh, use this one, but then when we tabulate states, we would like to have it in this specific order. Now, keep in mind now that what we have done here, our original state, which we had, this specific state here, that's a four particle state. Sorry. That's a four particle state. Whereas now, this is actually a five particle state. And this will obviously be orthogonal to the state which was a four particle state. So if we were to take the overlap between these two states, that should obviously be zero. So uh, what we are doing now when we operate on a given state, we create a new state which has an additional particle. So uh, one of the things which we also need to think of a little bit when we saw all these operations here, if I now interchange the columns uh, or the interchange if I want to bring this back in the way which we have chosen as an ordering, I would need to interchange these creation operators. So if you think of the state which we wrote here, it was written like this, which you have here, this one. But in order to bring it into that ordering which we have chosen, then we would need to change this with that with that one, with that one, and with that one. So let's do that. So what happens now is that we need an additional rule here. So if I take this state, which I now generated, that means this specific state, and I want this into this form here, what we have, so the first one is now given by alpha, and then I have alpha zero, alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3, which is the same as A alpha, A alpha 0, A alpha 1, A alpha 2, A alpha 3, acting on 0. Now, what I'm going to do first is to interchange these two. So I'm just going to do this by operator by operator. So that means I need to change these two. Now, if I change these two, then the anti-symmetry, which I have enforced into this representation, tells me that this is equal to alpha zero, alpha, alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three, right? Because now I'm interchanging in a Slater determinant. This is the same as interchanging two columns. Now, in a Slater determinant, the full Slater determinant, you have the spatial degrees of freedom as well. Now, in order to keep this feature, we must require that if I interchange two of these slots, then it has to change sign. So this is how I enforce the Pauli principle in this representation. Because in the beginning, this representation is agnostic. It doesn't know anything about the Pauli principle. The Pauli principle is easily implemented with a Slater determinant. And there we see that we have a determinant, you change two columns, minus sign. Now here, we don't have the positions of the particles. We are looking at the number of particles in a given slot. So in this representation then, we need to bring in an additional rule. So when we interchange two of these slots, then we have to change the sign. So that means that what we have now 
is that we must have minus a alpha zero, a alpha. And then we have the reminder here. So this means that there has to be some kind of uh, rules which we want to implement. So if you shuffle this to the other side, then the two of them, if I take this side here and this side and just add them together, then you see that there has to be a so-called anti-commutation rule. So in order to obey that, each two operators so when we look at the, the first two ones, what it means, if I just take A alpha zero dagger, A alpha one dagger, no, sorry, A, A alpha, sorry, not that one. I had A alpha dagger and A alpha zero, and then, I take and subtract the other side. Then what I get then is plus A alpha zero times A alpha. And this has to be equal to zero. So I'm simply taking what we had here, this side, and transfer it to the other side. And that gives me zero. So that means that the two operators which we have here, these two operators, they have to fulfill a anti-commutation rule. And this is normally written either in this term, A alpha dagger, A alpha zero. And it's written with a plus, just to indicate that this is not the standard commutation rule where you have a minus. It's alternatively also written like this. And this is the notation which we are going to use, these curly brackets to indicate that this is an anti-commutator, which means that instead of having a minus sign for the normal commutation relation, we have a plus sign. And this is normally written like this, alpha zero. And this has to be equal to zero. So that's an important rule. So we can generalize this just to, to a general uh, A of alpha and then A of beta dagger and this has to be equal to zero. So that's the first rule. And that follows from the anti-symmetry, which we now are implementing at this single particle level. Does that sound okay? Now, the next uh, thing we do now is to define the opposite of a creation operator. So also keep in mind that if I want to, if I have a state alpha already occupied, this has to be equal to zero because I cannot have more than one uh, particle in a given quantum mechanical slot, in a given state. Now, what we define next are the annihilation operators or destruction operators. So destruction sounds more violent than annihilation. So let's use annihilation. Define the annihilation operators. Annihilation. And in this case, what we're going to have now is an operator A of alpha, which when it acts on, on the vacuum state, plain emptiness, like my brain, then it obviously has to, there's nothing to destroy. So this has to be equal to zero, right? This is just a definition. And it makes sense because if there is nothing to destroy, then it should be zero. Then, if we have this A alpha acting on a state alpha, then this has to be equal to the vacuum state. So then we destroy it. So there was a state uh, occupied, alpha, and then we take it away. So that means that we are removing a particle. What it means, for instance, for this specific example, which we had, if you now look at that one, so when I act with A alpha on this state alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three, then we have to 
be a little bit careful. So if alpha is contained in this alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three, then there is a state which we can emulate. And that means that suppose now that alpha as an example is equal to alpha zero, then the action of this operator on the state, alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, that is going now to be equal to alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three. So what we've done now is to move from n equal four to n equal to three. So we have destroyed or taken away a particle and our Slater determinant now is not a four particle Slater determinant, but it's a three particle Slater determinant. Now this operator, which we have defined is actually going to be the Hermitian conjugate of uh, the creation operator. So this is going to be A alpha. We write it like this. So this is the Hermitian conjugate. Of A alpha dagger. That means that since this is a Hermitian conjugate, that means that the same commutation relation we have must apply uh, to the uh, annihilation operators. So that means that what we have now is an anti-commutation relation where I have an A alpha, no, not that one, but this one. is equal to zero. So we have two anti-commutation relations now, or just sloppily commutation relations. So let's summarize them. So what we have now is two commutation relations or anti-commutation. So what we have is an A alpha dagger, A beta dagger, equal to A alpha, A beta, which are both equal to zero. So the last one here is actually given by A alpha, A beta plus A beta times A alpha. So we need, uh, in order to be able to perform calculations, we need yet another anti-commutation rule. So we need a third rule. And this is the one which we're going to describe now. We need a new rule, an additional rule. And we are going to show now that this is actually given by A alpha dagger, or you can interchange it with the other one. So you can have a a alpha and a beta dagger. And this is going to be equal to a chronic delta, delta alpha or beta. And with these three rules, we have the rules by which we can calculate expectation values. So let's take a, uh, uh, instead of deriving it, so let's wait with deriving that rule and let's look at some practical applications, okay? before we derive the rule. So let's now assume that we, we accept these rules and lo let's look at some practical examples. So what we are going to do now is to have an example where we are going to calculate an expectation value or just a norm of a state. So let's assume that we have a, a given state alpha and this state alpha is now given by A alpha dagger multiplied with a vacuum state. And then I have a new state, beta, which is given by A beta acting on the vacuum state. Okay, so this is just following the definitions which we have set up. What I want to do now is to calculate the norm of these two states. So if I want the norm, what I need to set up then, 
So this is the quantity I want to calculate. So I want to calculate beta with alpha. So that obviously means that I have to set up the uh, emission conjugate of beta. So that means that what I get now is zero, but then I have the emission conjugate. So I have beta and I have alpha of dagger and zero. So this is an uh, expectation value. Actually, it's the, the, the norm or the, uh, the inner product of two vectors, which you will see again and again. Now, if you look at this one, we can now use this anti-commutation relation in order to find out what the result is. So if we use the anti-commutation relation, we know that this A of beta, A alpha dagger plus A alpha dagger of A beta has to be equal to delta alpha beta. So now I'm just using the anti-commutation rule. And that means that I'm going to change this expectation value in terms of delta alpha beta minus A alpha of A beta, okay? So what you will see now is a basic trick which we are going to generalize through a theorem, which is called Wick's theorem. And what you will see now is that you will have all the annihilation operators or the destructions operator to the right and all the creation operators to the left. So creation to the left and destruction to the right sounds almost like a political statement, which is actually not so far from reality. <laughs> Sorry. I couldn't. <laughs> okay. If you now insert this, what you will find then is that you have zero, A beta, A alpha is equal to Kronika delta, alpha beta. And then I have just zero, zero, which is one. That is defined as one. And then we have minus, and then we have zero, A alpha. <clears throat> and A beta. Now, what you're seeing now is something which we will use to derive Wick's theorem. Because the way I rewrote this uh, expectation value, or you might call it, this is actually an inner product between two vectors, this specific way here is something I can rewrite in terms of a Kronecker delta. And in terms of this uh, expectation value here, and you see now that uh, when this acts on that one, if we use the definition, that has to be zero. So when A beta acts on zero, this is equal to zero. So the second term is zero. And we are just left with delta alpha beta, which is obvious. Because if beta is different from alpha, then the norm or the inner product of these two vectors should be zero. Does that sound reasonable? So what we have now is actually a, a, a extremely interesting result, which we are going to use when we generalize this to many such strings of operators. So you, what you will see, the typical recipe is actually that you change the uh, expectation value so that you will have at least one destruction operator acting on the vacuum. And that means that you can immediately set that matrix element or this kind of expectation value to zero. Okay, so the next point which we are going to do now is actually to derive this expression, which we have for the anti-commutation rule. But we will need a little bit more time than uh, the remaining time which we have today, which is roughly two minutes left. So next week, we actually next Thursday, we are going to derive this anti-commutation relation, and then we are going to apply this to examples, and then we are going to derive Wick's theorem, which will generalize this to a strings of many operators, because we are going to have states which will be defined by many such creation operators, and we are also going to rewrite the one-body and the two-body interactions in terms of uh, these creation and annihilation operators. And then we're going to derive the calculation of rules 
And what you will see then, compared to what we did here, we will obviously get the same expectation values, which we got earlier. So when we set up these expectation values, like, like the quantity which you see here, we will obviously get the same, but the calculations are going to be simplified because we are not going to deal with the spatial degrees of freedom and other degrees of freedom, except that we're going to count the number of particles which are allowed to be in a given state. And that will simplify the, the calculation of machinery. And that's why second quantization is such a, how to say, efficient way to perform uh, money body calculations. So this is one of the kind of main motivations. And the other thing, as I mentioned, when you want to encode a specific Slater determinant, you would normally encode that as a string of bits one and zero. And that's something you can easily do with second quantization, as you will see later. So we're gonna stop here. And then next week we will derive the final anti-commutation rule and then move into uh, the proving Wick's theorem, which will be the calculational recipe for setting up many of these uh, expectation values. So Wick's theorem is extremely powerful in order to calculate expectation values. Okay, so let's stop here. And then we have exercises.